Hi, and welcome to the Machine Ethics Podcast. This week, I'm talking to Lydia Nicholas. You can find more podcasts at machine-ethics.net, on iTunes, and support us on Patreon. Thank you to all our supporters, including Tony Finch. Here's this month's podcast. So, hi, Lydia. <laughs> hi. Hi. Thanks for joining me on this. You're thinking I have to cut really, that off, aren't you? Yeah. No, it's fine. Look, uh, um, thanks for joining me on this really warm and uh, muggy day um, yeah. in London. And could you introduce yourself a little bit and what you're doing at the moment? Okay. Uh, my name is Lydia Nicholas. I, uh, I suppose the shortest title I ever give anyone is that I'm a digital anthropologist. Um, I mostly work in areas where uh, technology, data, human bodies and identity kind of meet and squish together. Uh, so at the moment I am four days a week at Nesta, the UK's innovation charity, uh, where I work as a senior researcher in collective intelligence and do quite a bit of work on machine learning ethics and data ethics. Uh, some of which uh, connects up with work being done by the Royal Society and the Cabinet Office and so forth. Previously I've kind of worked in a lot of other places around that intersection point, so mm. looked at interdisciplinary science, um, things like quantified self, uh, even stuff in gaming and online dating. Yeah, I mean when I was looking at your website it has quite like a plethora of like different stuff Yeah. Um, uh, from comedy and technology yeah. and writing and games and um, <laughs> future anthropologist network. Yeah. So there's quite a lot. Do you of... want me to tell you what all of those things yeah, are? Yeah, tell us so about some of those things. Okay. Um, Briefly. Ha! Well, okay, I suppose it all really comes down to an interest in systems and, and uh, systems that generate themselves and adapt themselves. Mm. So... Uh, I am not a game designer, but for a couple of years I ran a playtesting meetup just because I found the uh, that kind of intersection of testing how you create uh, certain kinds of experiences mm. and interactions so fascinating. Uh, and kind of off the back of that, I've ended up doing a bunch of interesting things. Uh, I also worked for a while for a business intelligence in media kind of company, so that yeah. involved a lot of like future media technologies and game stuff. Um, so I have mm. another podcast, I have my own podcast, which ah, is Dungeons okay. and Dragons Comedy. Um, so if you want to check out The Rusty Quill for about as different yep. a podcast as you're going to find Brilliant. on the it's, planet. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, people have different interests. People, so, you know. yeah. I mean, if you like systems and political comedy, like yeah, that might be a place okay. to go. Uh, yeah, that and... So I like to think about using stories and art and generative kind of media to think about all of these different ways that we can think and perceive which are super useful mm -hmm. um they're really useful to get additional angles on uh, when you're trying to look at essentially immaterial problems so if you're trying to work with scientists to think mm -hmm. about why they're struggling to uh, communicate across a disciplinary divide the issues about what what their idea of certainty and finished is, what they think a process should look like, how they uh, communicate habits to one another, mm. uh, all the little things of everyday practice and of how respect and quality are kind of measured. That can be very different. So just talking to someone, mm. uh, they often haven't actually interrogated those ideas in their own heads, uh, which is perfectly natural. So taking a slightly quirky angle on it and writing them some sci-fi stories or getting them to think through different kinds of scenarios is actually yes. a super useful way to illuminate those. Right, so it's kind of a reflective process of like modelling what it is that they... Yeah. The systems that they didn't know they had yeah, sort of thing, yeah. so that they can talk to other people meaningfully. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. Um, which is super useful when you start talking about big data and algorithms and machine mm -hmm. learning because one of the big issues that you have uh, when you're trying to talk to someone that might be commissioning a machine learning system or that might be trying to analyse one is that there's it's very hard to understand how alien the thinking, or I, that scare quotes mm. thinking, yeah. that goes on inside uh, an algorithm is, uh, how very different it is. And so like, in order to kind of get that out, you have to be yeah. talking... Uh, to people in slightly strange ways. 
So, so kind of, in a way, you're, you're in, for an anthropologist, you're focusing what your skills that you've learned from humans, right? And using them in a similar way for algorithms. And you're saying, no, I'm always this is studying... how they communicate and this is how they are going to produce and think. I, I think I'm, I'm always studying humans. Yeah. Uh, but as part of that, it's about thinking about how humans think about uh, how yeah. other things think. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I got to be on a panel with uh, Darius Kazemi, the yeah. uh, internet artist behind Tiny Subversions, and he spoke a lot there about how um, he never tries to make his bots appear human. He tries to kind of bring the very alienness of their thinking and their structuring out through mm -hmm. the play and through jokes, through the fact that you know his his two headline spot will never get bored of making the same joke. Although that actually yeah. reflects quite a lot of Twitter users as well. Sure, right? sure. But um, they'll just keep doing the same thing, keep yeah. mashing things together, have no understanding of how those concepts are strange to each other. Yeah. And they kind of mash Pope, uh, headlines Glastonbury. They mm. don't know why that's funny. And a lot of his more sophisticated ones really play with that. Do you think, um, I mean, that, that probably brings us back to the first question that I usually ask people is, what, what do they think when they think of artificial intelligence? So what is it, when, when people talk about AI in mm -hmm. your mind, what do you see? So I see sophisticated pattern matching. I mean, I know mm. that that's what humans do as well, but they're in no way anywhere near as good at abstraction. So, you know, they, they mm. still struggle with the idea that a cartoon dog, a like picture of a dog, the like actual 3D moving representation of a dog, yeah. or an actor with a mask on, all come under the heading dog yeah, sure. with, for, in certain kinds of ways in a human mind. So... Uh, yeah, they're very good at clustering different kinds of data points, and they can do that mm. in ways that are extraordinarily useful and powerful, uh, but I don't see something that I'm going to have a complex conversation with anytime soon. Yeah. I mean, the simple conversations that you have with them are absolutely fascinating. Sure. Uh, but it's more a systemic thing, right? You're talking to a system, and you're, yeah, you're intrigued by system. that rather than exactly any sort of kind of conscious yeah yeah and frankly you can often see that when you talk to humans and you're kind of like why do we disagree on this fundamental mm. point and then you realize that there's a very different set of principles driving them like yeah um if you talk to people that might have say if from religion they've got an idea of a very absolute view of what is right or wrong that comes from a fixed point mm -hmm. versus someone that either doesn't have religion or doesn't think of morals in that kind of way and they try and and they think of morals as more of a, a relative kind of concept and then trying to have an argument mm. about so, like very controversial issues everything from like the environment to control over women's bodies or health or all sorts of things there like you're not actually having necessarily the argument you think that you're having because right. it actually stems from having very different systems yeah which is the, the ideologies that they have yeah and yeah and so you, up in you're, so. yeah so that I, I think you can sometimes abstract in a quite kind of vague way there but um because yeah humans mm. are complicated complicated systems sometimes yeah. you get to see like little bits of what the clashes are. I'm sorry if that's too uh, vague and wishy-washy for a proper like data. No, no, I think you, you nailed it straight off by saying pattern matching and then you elaborated, so that's, <laughs> that's totally cool. What excites you in this sphere at the moment? I mean, in, in machine learning or, you know, you are talking about generative stuff earlier, um, this, or the big data stuff, what, do you, what excites you? What makes you want to get involved with it in the first place? Uh, what makes me want to get involved with it, what mm -hmm. I find exciting and interesting, uh, and what kind of really sparks my inspirational kind of, quick yeah. bit in my head of kind of three different things. Right. What makes me want to think about it more is that I think that it's one more uh, means by which uh, those that already have assets and power accrue more assets and power right. and entrench systems of uh, control and inequality. Um, mm -hmm. Because these are systems that can encode and hide uh, not just the obvious systemic discrepancies, like there was the story about uh, the uh, algorithm used to predict uh, whether a person would commit more crimes after yeah. uh, after being sentenced for one that was found to be massively racist as well as massively inaccurate recently. Mm. Uh, 
like those things are very obvious yeah. and although they're very very difficult to pick apart because it's hard for a civil rights group to have access to the input data the output data um let alone what's actually going on in the system because sure. that's protected by the trade secrets act but that's quite difficult to, to pick apart even for the makers right yeah, like yeah, it can be. Although yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of ways in which they could test the mm. impact of something like. Although it doesn't supposedly collect race, mm. um, there are a lot of ways that they could test against that. Yeah. Um, they could even have just checked a thousand times, like run people through the yeah, system yeah, yeah, exactly. and worked yeah, yeah. out, you know, and done the exact same analysis that the um, that ProPublica did. Uh, I think it was ProPublica. Mm. Uh, that the magazine that. Uh, that the reporting uh, group did on it. Um, so I was at an event with the LSE who uh, brought in a bunch of people who were working on different kinds of tools where you could uh, check how, check the weighting of different factors mm. in uh, black boxed machine learning systems. And these are and there's uh, someone that we often talk to uh, at Nesta and has fed into some of our work with Michael Veal, who is looking mm. at how, what kind of tools that you'll need to develop to assess the wider impact of machine learning systems, like the, the social impact beyond the exact kind of narrow thing the machine learning system is trying to look at. Yeah. And all of those things definitely could happen. It's just about whether we think it's important enough to invest in those. Like if we made it a regulatory uh if we kind of enshrined in regulation yeah. that any machine learning system used by the government, by local mm. government, by policymakers at various levels, had to be checked according to certain kinds of, like, had to be held to a higher standard in terms of yeah. transparency, that they had to, like, for every system that was used, they had to invest in certain kinds of tools. Um, if there was funding through, like, the various, uh, what? I know it's it's all been combined into a new board just like a couple of weeks ago, hasn't it? Like the technology, the uh, science research councils, what have they? They've been combined mm. into something, haven't really? they? Really? Who? Which ones have been combined into? Uh, um, like the arts council, like arts uh, research council, the medical, yeah, yeah, like yeah. all they've all been put into one thing with technology innovate UK at the top. Technology research councils. That's oh dear! Completely. Ch- yeah, which makes them more vulnerable to cutting entirely, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, but uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what the move would accomplish, sort of thing. Cutting overheads. Yes. Oh. Um, if, like, basically, if if you sort of said that all kinds of algorithms and machine learning systems that were used by government mm. had to be uh, checked in certain ways, or that they had to give a certain amount of funding to researchers yep. who were going to create tools that helped you, check that kind of system, then think, you could advance those interests. Do you think that would happen? And also, you say governments, but most of these people, most of these things are being developed in the public, the private yeah. sector, right? So yeah. are you saying that only public sector machine learning tools need to be checked or just all of them? Or So the work that I'm doing... Or none of them, I don't know. The work that I'm doing at yeah. Esther is specifically on machine learning in government. Right. And one of the reasons there is that Government knows it has to be held to a higher standard. Yep. Uh, it knows that there are certain uh, kinds of get-out freeze of, of discrimination in algorithms that, uh, like if you're offering loans to people as a private yeah. sector company, right. it is okay for you to get away with not offering loans to a lot of people that actually could pay you back because you've set a kind of level of certainty in your algorithm or uh, that means that they don't get yeah, um, but just so long as the algorithm is more profitable than having a human do it, yeah. um, they if it can be proved that they're being specific, if the if it can be proved that they're specifically discriminating against protected categories like yeah. race, gender, trans. But do you not think that thing, needs to be transparent? Therefore, I I do think that. But the point is that if yeah. you can if you can do this in government systems, mm-hmm. then you support the creation of tools yeah. that then hopefully you can provide back to people to investigate private sector things. Yep. Now, I do think that you absolutely need more regulation of the private sector. I absolutely don't yep. want to make it think... You've seen that I'm... Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to let them get away with it, but it's an issue where I think that the wins come, not yep. easy wins, but the medium level wins yeah. come from uh, working through these problems in a public sector setting, mm. which... It, they often have extraordinarily complex problems to deal with and they're extremely interesting to academic yeah. researchers and if they can, if we can work those ones out, then hopefully those tools can then be used 
um, in other settings. Yeah. I really wish we lived in a world where I could hold Google to account, but uh, I don't really think I'm going to, or any of us are going to quite manage that until we build tools in other settings. I think um, when you're just when you're just talking now, I, I was having um, and kind of an idea of whether it's because the actual problem isn't that isn't of transparency it's a misuse right it's yeah of, yeah so i feel like it's more you could do it as a branding exercise yeah so so we've thought about kite marking systems right um ideas that you might have like if you had to get a stamp of yes, approval exactly. on every yeah, single yeah. machine so learning algorithm out there that's yeah person has looked at it and yeah. interrogated it somehow if you had to have that on everything yep. that would be impossible because people sure. might try a machine learning system on like so what are the sentiments of tweets in leads today so that i can mm. maybe like do a put a voucher for like free ice cream like yeah. and yeah, tie yeah. it to that and it doesn't necessarily need that much oversight but if it was valuable for you to have a kite marking stamp mm. you know privacy as a consumer option um, I mean, you don't. I mean, one of the problems with that is that you end up with privacy being a privilege, which is right. already a problem in a lot of places. Yeah. Right? The idea that if you're receiving benefits, then you're under a lot more surveillance. If you're in a disadvantaged community, you're in a lot more surveillance. And so that means that more data is made about you in all of these cases, which means yeah. you're more likely to encounter more surveillance and more discrimination, and that goes on and on and on. Right, right, right. So there's dangers in that, but. I, I think that kind of kite marking system is another thing that we've been looking at right. and campaigning for. Yeah, I think that's um, like super interesting, like uh, two pronged attack sort of thing. Hmm. Okay, cool. Well, I think. Sorry, this is going all over the place. I'm talking I, um, over myself a lot. No, it's fine. It's uh, it's cool. I've not done one of these in person yet. I've oh. always over Skype, so ah. this is quite fun or like. Interesting. There's a human in front of. Oh me. my god! I yeah. can actually like look at them and they can see my face like. Uh, yeah, um, probably, you look so disapproving. I know. That's why I keep all stopping the time. and changing. He's mid flow. <laughs> um, so, what I think we asked earlier, kind of the what inspires you, what excites you, yeah. that sort of stuff, and we started with why. Like so, yeah. I've summarised in I'm working in it yeah. because I think that it is about uh, those with power accreting more power. Yep, exactly. And. I think that it's a very hard thing to think through, and so I want to be at that point where I help people think about that problem. Mm -hmm. I'm not ambitious enough to think that I can solve it, but like that's an interesting thing to help people think about in all sorts of places. Um, what uh, what makes me excited and inspired? I get really interested mm. in machine learning and art and feedback systems. I, I mean, this is just my esoteric interest. Yeah, sure. I like. I get extremely interested in the possibilities of kind of the biofeedback of if I'm uh, if I'm thinking about a certain kind of design and then mm. a, a, like a machine learning system wants to. This is all just my like crazy thoughts about like design and machine learning and emotional feedback. Though it's not really real. Um, it's just the stuff that I like to think about. <laughs> well, you can sure. ever say it and have someone like maybe make it if they listen to yeah. it. Yeah. Or or just like keep it for like another. Yeah, time, yeah, yeah. No, but I know people are already kind of doing it. Yeah. I, uh, so I get really interested in projects that combine uh, big data, yep. sometimes machine learning, although that might be a relatively small part of it, and mm -hmm. there's more sophisticated algorithms than learning algorithms, and media and arts and design. So there's stuff going on in the BBC R&D department at the moment, mm -hmm. which is where well, they're just playing with the idea, don't worry, they're not like making it really yet, but... Uh, ideas of how if they are going to collect data about you if they're yeah. going to access all of this kind of information that's available about you online uh, how they might adapt media for you so in real time kind of adapting like the news you read the media that you watch mm. maybe if your interests are a certain way like you will scenes will be cut from a major drama and they'll expand other kinds of themes I uh, maybe you'll read a news report that talks about exactly like how the issue going on is affecting your local area in particular and there'll be ideas about mm. what your interest like, might be about the kind of thing the products you'll buy or the the kind of causes that matter to you that might be highlighted in, in those kind of things yeah and how that all works now you see they're doing it in a kind of experimental what does this mean so they can think through yeah. the ethics stuff and be a be a key point for that kind of idea but i mean obviously it all kind of 
feeds back to the very kind of Google and Facebook idea of creating mm. a personalized market of one. Like we're no longer a big market. We're sort of someone that can be, we can have a personalized bubble wrapped around us with kind of easy buttons to press mm. that mean that our interests are predicted and encouraged. And often in those cases, they're, they're encouraged to be more consumerist, more kind of uh, And what do, you, what do you think about this behavior? So when it's when it's done in a by a big business, it yeah. kind of terrifies me because when I've interviewed people about it, so I did a bit of research on this, um, it it pushes people towards easy ruts of identity, mm. like uh, the idea that in the simplest form, like the fact that if you're a girl, you must like this; if you're yeah. a boy, you must like this. So you interview uh, someone who works for a big gaming company, and they're like. I, I play these games, I'm really good mm. at them, I also, for my work, I'm looking at all kinds of other games, uh, and of course, I, I just see razors everywhere, like, you know, the best a man can get, and it's yeah, like, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm a woman in my early 20s, like, I don't need, uh, like, a, a, a razor advertised to me with a car, it just yeah. feels very strange, um, I don't need, like, I don't know, every, every kind of object seems to be like advertising me with all sorts of images of steel and kind of it's yeah. just a very strange it feels like an alien environment and of course you see all sorts of strange porn because they yeah. think that that's that's who you are i mean when i used to work as a developer i used to see like so so much more porn like just advertised on random websites because they thought you're searching for code like yeah, to, yeah. to fix things and like so whereas whereas now i search for social science issues and i see all sorts of like would you like to volunteer in Africa? And it's like, no! <laughs> yeah. It's quite... It's, a, it's, it's both extremes. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. So they're in, in many ways, they're kind of pushing people to an extreme yeah. vision of what, say, in those cases, I'm talking about like either gender or gender assumed from your work interest. Yeah. Um, so it, like that, and that, uh, most of the time when I would interview people, it would be like the further you are from the kind of straight, white usually male kind of uh, consumer then the harder you would find it like mm. uh, like some of the sort of gay interviewees would talk about how things they were advertised clearly made assumptions about them um, sure. um, so that makes me super worried about the fact that these things entrench existing kind of norms like yeah. we know that when people use online dating sites and now about like a third of marriages in the US uh, started on an online dating site and that's including all the people that got married before online dating sites existed so like the stats are yeah. insane like the, you know the robot apocalypse is already here they're breeding us in you know they're, they're already doing that we know that uh, relationships that start on online dating sites across the world so whether you're using shardy.com or okcupid mm -hmm. are going to be more aligned with kind of, you're going to pick people of the same race the same caste the same like economic level like people don't meet and cross kind of those sorts of yeah. divides they don't meet haphazardly and fall in love and is that just blur the, and bend those things is that just because the algorithms have found that that's the case it's, or that it's there's because, weights in place that we've put I mean there. in that kind of case it's it's a mix because yeah. it's partly that people are a lot more judgmental and narrow-minded when they're clicking boxes than yeah. when they're meeting people in real life. So a lot of that is people making that decision. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But yeah. there are, there are these systems are getting smarter and smarter. And so I, I worry about that. I worry about things entrenching social divides yeah. and deepening norms. But yeah. <laughs> I get really excited about the, the possibilities for when we understand and we work with those systems, like redesigning ourselves in really interesting kinds of ways. Mm. Like how can I design my environment in ways that have kind of recursive feedback that make me a better person? Right. I, instead of necessarily kind of, you know, Amazon nudging me towards ever more purchasing. Yeah. Like can I be nudged towards being more green, more caring, yeah. more like meditative and restful I, I don't know all those things yeah um and can i create kind of new art worlds in which i can in, in, enjoy like i can find my ideal kind of aesthetic because yeah. an algorithm can work out what my biofeedback is in response to different kinds of colors and shapes and create something beautiful yeah. for me like that kind of thing is i mean um 
I think there's a real... I'm not, I'm not. No, no, no. It's I'm cool. not working for your podcast at all. There's, um, there's, a real, there's a real distinction in my mind about all that stuff. And there's yeah. there's a we, we can, so we will attitude, mm-hmm. which is from the business side of stuff, which ha- which um, which is why this is like the, the machine ethics podcast. Yeah. There's a lack of, I think, and a lack of like uh, self-reflection and mm. ethics, morals, basically. Yeah. Be- because of the... the the capitalist kind of infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. So you've got... So what you've kind of pictured there is like this lush, like, public or co- kind of community yeah. version of, of that. Yeah. Uh, where there's not necessarily this incentive to spend money, but we're mm. still using the set tools that yeah. we, we're building, right? Um, which is fantastic and, and it's and just very really frustrating. Implausible. Very, very well, unlikely Well, I mean, you know, if we get some of these, you know, <laughs> yeah. projects... Um, miraculously to get loads of money then we can do it but that's, that's I think that's the crunch isn't it it's like um, how can we move yeah. forward without any yeah. agenda a lot of these things uh, I don't know if they if they specifically apply to your kind of machine learning focus or big data focus because they they tie in with wider kinds of ideas of what's important so yeah. when uh, you think about biomedical information and uh so I like I, I think quite a bit about the properties that information has that we don't see or talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you might think about the fact that a numerical bit of information is more certain, is more valuable mm-hmm. than a paragraph describing the same phenomena. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and this is part of this kind of wider thing of the idea that information that is more liquid. Well, which is a sort of term you borrow from finance. That you want liquid assets that move through systems more easily. Information right. that is more liquid is more valuable because it can be uh, assessed at all sorts of different scales. It can be like you know recontextualized in all mm. sorts of different graphs and visualizations and tools and things like that. And compare, you know, you can compare yeah. test results at kind of the individual level, at the class level, the school, the university, the or the country, the the world. And so all of these things make it, like, push us towards a world where everything is datified and everything that can't be put down in numbers mm. gets ignored. Um, and you're pre- hugely pressured to simplify things into a form that can be put into to numbers. But in fact, that's only one way of looking at the world. And we're not very good as humans mm. at looking at a particular kind of data output and thinking, well, that is the result of a 100 qualitative decisions about where I should put the sensor, about what the kind of what the upper and lower limits of what's important are, like what is important to measure, what is noise, and what community mm. should I go into and, and put sensors on them. I you know, so much of the information that we're getting about that say twenty three and me gets about mm. genetic kind of uh diseases and sorts of things that come from people who want to spend a hun- who want to and can spend a hundred dollars on a sort of yeah. relatively useless genetic test kit for sure. kind of fun random science knowledge um it you know it's it's not really particularly good at telling you your warning signs for anything important uh and so that means they get a very biased data sample and we get more and more and more information about those kinds of people and it gets more and more easy to learn things and help you know and make helpful things for those kinds of people um and that you know there's all sorts of things like people don't think about the fact that the vast majority of uh medical trials are done on men right uh women were banned from American medical trials until the mid-1990s, right. uh, and still 70% of uh, clinical trials are done on men, and you find that women report vastly more side effects, and they you know, they, they retested a couple of drugs like Ambien and they found mm. in 2014, and they found that women actually require half the dose. And these are things about data. Like, this is important because it looks to a lot of people like their spreadsheet can tell them the world we, yeah. you know, and that the more data you get the more you can understand it's called the n equals all fallacy um you know that the mm. idea that the more data we get the more we understand this phenomenon so sure. if we understand all data we understand all the world but you know it's not really the case and we end yeah. up living according to the fact that it's the case like as if these things are true so your doctor tells you you can't have that symptom you can't have that side effect yeah. because that's not in the list it's, of side effects. It's a, it's a computer says no situation, isn't it? Yeah, it's like you can't have that side effect. The thing says that you didn't have it, mm-hmm. but the fact is that was never tested on women. So, like, yeah. I have told you that your experience is invalid. Yeah. And so that can't, and so you're sent away without, like, and that, that is the kind of world that if we don't enter it with these, and I know they can be kind of, 
the squishy bits around data. Yep. And I know that we absolutely want the things that data can give us, but if we don't go into that world with that those open eyes and that willingness to think about how our perceptions are being guided a certain way, um, then that's that's the kind of world that we're falling into. Uh, so that's why I often kind of try mm. and come up with weird stories and like commissioned stories. We've got a collection online now yep. about kind of world, living with these complex systems and uh, what machine learning and collective intelligence platforms might kind of make a world for us, yep. what kinds of things they'll create for us. Uh, so that's on the long and short. Um, it kind of seems quite bleak yeah. if you put it in that context, I guess. Yeah. I think what you're basically saying Although is... Although this, to... this is a world that is giving us extraordinary cures and yeah. extraordinary efficiencies and new tools. And I can search my Google Photos for, oh, I know I took a picture of a football yeah. I, and it turns up. I mean, the stuff it gives us is amazing. I think I often talk about this stuff with the assumption that people think that this stuff is amazing yeah. and they need a little bit of a kind right, of right, right. knock-off kilter. Yeah. And I realise more and more that that's become a kind of dangerous way to talk because, you know, suspicions are building and you need to kind of say, actually, you, yeah. also, you do also need to con contribute data, say for like the Human Genomics Project or Genomics England's, mm. uh, you know, uh, 100,000 Genomes Project. These things are really useful. They can help us save kids' lives. Yeah. Um, just want you to go in knowing what that consent form means. Yeah. And I mean, Genomics England's project is amazing because they, they do work through very carefully that you do understand that. But that's not how, say, uh, a credit agency that decides a lot of things about, you know, where, when you can get money, who verifies your identity and whether mm -hmm. you have access to certain services, they're not going to bother with that kind of ethics thing. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a wobbly kind of... Do you think... If if that's the case, and not, they're not going to have like an, age, an ethics agency or a consultant or some sort of third party mm. governmental quango yeah. or anyone else looking at that sort of thing in that circumstance, yeah. Do you think that? Well, I hope that we do. I'm just trying to yeah. start with government oversight. Do you think um, it would be easier if we just added it to education? I think one of those things we yeah. could do is just add it to the curriculum, yeah, alongside religious education or or yeah, in in other understand your statistical world, like your yeah. uh, like. Uh, unfortunately, humans are really crap with uncertainty. Um, we're really bad at understanding predictions. Hmm. So you know, it's that it's like the fact that people react very very differently if they're told that an operation has a 90% chance of t saving them versus yeah. if they're told that it has a 10% chance of killing them like humans are so awful at that that the education would have to be extremely sophisticated and we also have to kind of you know make sure that people have basic math literacy first I don't even yeah, know if you need that much math literacy I, you just I don't, need to understand uncertainty yeah I mean I don't think that I don't think it is specifically what data means what or like how to collect data. I'm, I'm talking more broadly on, you know, being a reflective human being who thinks about the morality of situations. So I'm yeah. going to collect this thing. It's going to have an impact. I'm going to think about all the different impacts. Sure. That I mean, sort of situation. Rather, like, I'm I don't gonna... know if that sounds like an easier thing to change in education. No, I know. Exactly. Not necessarily. But um, I mean, the, the example I always give is... You know, we live in this world of um, ecological collapse, yep. and people are making selfie sticks. Mm. Like, it's one of those things which, uh, what's the word? It just kind of solidifies in my mind mm. everything that is bad about humanity. I mean, that's interesting <laughs> because the yeah. selfie stick is something to choose to be so angry about. Like, that's a thing of like of youth culture of imagery. Like, you know, people used to spend you know, 12 mm. days having a painter brought in to take a picture of them in their best clothes. Like, that's sure. not something new about human nature. I might say, we live in a world of ecological collapse. Why are we flying across the world to yeah. have a destination kind of party in... Yeah. I like, think that's, why do we eat true. steak? Like, that's... Yeah. <laughs> that I mean, I think that's, a, I think that's harder to um, unbunk because it's been... We've done it for so long. Mm. You know, certain things... We've always wanted to look at ourselves, though. Yeah. <laughs> that's... True. I think, but... I think that's about as fundamental as it gets. I think, because coming from a designer, it's just like why, like, why would you design something which is inherently bad? 
when you could be designing something good? Yeah. Or annoying, should I say? I suppose. I mean, you might find it annoying. I just think yeah. as a thing to pick on, it's an odd one. Like, yeah. Okay, well, so you many... can pick on like anything else, I guess, which is um, like aerosols. Aerosols are yeah. inherently bad, right? Or oh, microbeads. Why are we putting microbeads, microbeads yeah. in cosmetics? Sure. And freaking... I don't know, why are we taking, why am I not cooking my lunch at home and bringing yeah. it in, in a why aren't like, you doing wooden that? container? Because I work <laughs> such long hours that I don't have time okay. to cook, I, I promise it's not I, me. I think that's one of those ones which, that will go down a rabbit hole with that one. Yeah, um, basically, why why are humans so bad at fixing the world? Well, as I said, we're yeah. really terrible at understanding risk. We don't exactly. understand long-term risk. The risk of me being hungry in the next 15 minutes is much more real to me than the fact that cows are producing so yeah. much methane that that is killing the world and that the vast majority of arable land in the world is taken up by kind of meat farming yeah. that is unnecessary. And I feel like, I mean, this is a quite a tangent, but we learn that at school, right? Yeah. Which we, is, that's the thing, which we, already, we already educate people about this stuff, which anyway. is... Well, okay. Maybe so we should let the machines take over. I mean, they could do much worse of a job. Yeah, or maybe we just we stop trying to sell ourselves razors or yeah. corn and you know you use the same things to help us in, yeah. in different ways I guess I could be instead using all of that space to put up beautiful art or yes. like hey there's a you know if in, if online banner ads instead kind of advertised me to go to an anti-fracking protest or just included mm. interesting facts about the world so yep. I learned stuff definitely um, you know, the world uh, could be so much more beautiful. <laughs> so we're getting to the end. Would you like? Is there anything you would like to add on the theme of machine ethics? Ethics, machines. Um, anything? Like I that? think that whilst I might sound like a downer on machine learning in a lot of kind of official systems and decision making, like oh no, it could encode so much discrimination. It can also be an opportunity for transparency in that you will never see inside the skull of the judge making the sentencing decision. Mm. You can't know like, what they're thinking and why. But maybe with a machine learning system, even if the actual algorithm in the middle is a black box, you can work out a lot more from the direct inputs and outputs and the shape of it about what's going on in there. And you can unpick it and you can fix it and you can update it. Uh, it's just... It's just about approaching it from a point of view which has social justice at the core, I think. And, you know, there is some hope. There is some hope. Yeah. That's a, that's a beautiful line. We'll finish there. There is hope. It's not all doom and gloom. Um, <laughs> thank you, Lydia, for joining me today. Yeah, thank you.